Welcome to Creative Innovators with Gigi Johnson. Today, we're going to be talking with the Dub Lab team. We're going to be talking with Alejandra Cohen, known as Ale, who's its current director, and Mark McNeil, known as Frosty, its founder. They'll share with us the journey it took to get this company into first a for-profit, then a non-profit business, and its trials and travails now as it's trying to continue to serve the various communities locally and globally during the pandemic. And we'll start with Mark sharing with how this all got started. What got you into music and radio, and when did you start becoming a music fan, creator? What's your journey? I would say it was slow, a slow start, but it was an important start. I think that, you know, I didn't have wide access. Um, you know, I had my mom had a small but thoughtful record collection. You know, she wasn't a, a music kind of devotee, I guess, like, you know, I am now, but she had, you know, folk music and a broad range of, of sounds. So that that always interested me to kind of dive into her record collection. But then radio, I was more of like an AM gold kid. And I was born in 1976. So, you know, it was kind of of the era where you could hear still a lot of, you know, interesting shows on kind of AM radio. And for me, I liked the the fuzz and static and fluctuation between channels on, on that format. So I really liked scanning the AM dial. Um, but I was just into... Mark, where did you grow up? I was in a military family. So I moved all over. I moved nine times before I was 18 and moved all over the country, all over the US and also in Germany. But coming up, I, I was, I would consider myself a passive music listener you know i was i would appreciate the sounds that came my way but i didn't seek out sounds um but i started to get into this idea of of broadcasting i came from a theater background and i i started to think about broadcasting as a way to kind of project ideas and messages to people and to be able to play with kind of the mystery and the magic of of the voice and sound uh, as a way to reach people and so when I went to the University of Southern California for my undergraduate studies in 1999, Yay! I immediately um, <laughs> I was about checked out the years radio ahead station. Of you, Wonderful. Years ahead all of you. right. Oh my gosh. 20 years. It's all again. It's all part of the continuum, you know. It's, the the uh, time. Uh, time moving. So you went to USC and broadcast I went to journalism? USC and I, I, you know, I started in uh, just communications, the most general thing. But then I switched to theater and then I switched to music industry near the end and ended up getting theater and music industry. But really, I would say the radio station was my education. And I immediately got involved with the radio station KSCR at that point, which was an unlicensed low power radio station. And it was the USC had KUSC, which was a student radio station. Then it became uh, the university realized, wow, we could use the radio as sort of a calling card and create this flagship NPR station, which is a good idea. But they ended up cutting the students out of the picture and they hired a professional staff to take over that radio station. And so suddenly the students had no radio station. So KSCR came into being. And in fact, some of the KUSC, the early staff helped set up the transmitters because they were students at the student radio station and then became part of the professional KUSC staff. So they understood that radio was important tool for students to have. So this, student radio station started but by the time it started the los angeles uh, airwaves were full there was no way to get an official you know broadcast license so you've got this sh you know shadowy kind of broadcast entity at the university for years and years but it also meant that you had a really open laboratory and space for experimentation and sound and so the people who came together at that same time were just you know was lucky people who are on a similar wavelength of pushing sound forward, experimenting, being really fearless with how they approached, you know, the idea of radio. And those were really the first kind of, that's really the first collective that formed Dublab. You know, we decided towards the end of that adventure in, in 
1998, we got shut down by the FCC. They did a huge nationwide sweep of low power FM stations because it came on the heels of the 1996 Telecommunications Act that basically made you know corporate grasp on radio where suddenly instead of hundreds of radio stations owners you had like six people who owned all the stations around the country and they put pressure on the FCC to then lock down the radio waves the airwaves and so all of the micro power community radio stations that they were unlicensed, but they were unlicensed because there was no way to get a license at that Unless point. Unless you were going to buy a stick, uh, which yeah. was gigantically expensive in the LA yeah. market. At that time, yeah. I was actually banking the radio conglomerates. I apologize. That was <laughs> a dark part of my life. Well, let it's me back a, it was up an a interesting, <laughs> interesting moment, though. And, you know, and it was, uh, it was, it was, is a Colin Colin Powell's son, Colin Powell's son, who was running the FCC, and there was like it was very much it was a conservative uh, world when it came to communications. So let me back up, Ali. Where did you grow up, and were you a music fanatic or creator when you were a young person? Uh, well, I grew up in Buenos Aires, Argentina, um, and uh, I my connection to music, I, I, I didn't come from a musical family. Uh, my exposure to music was similar to to Marx. Um, I could say my, my, my family's uh, personal music collection was pretty much what you would expect of uh, that, that era. A lot of like uh, adult contemporary, you know, a lot of like some Beatles, some Billy Joel, some uh, even like you know, you could say Barry Manilow or Carpenters, uh, things like that. And then uh, and being in Latin America, some uh, Latin American versions of that, um, that, that, that uh, it, it, they, they did influence me musically. But uh, I did have a, a very um, emotional connection to, to, to music. And I remember uh, early on uh, in my life uh, being very very drawn to to um i don't i don't think i ever shared this but very very drawn to um uh, uh soundtrack music and strangely I, I even thought myself like why am i so so into it i remember uh for someone that is exposed to main mostly ma- mainstream media uh things like uh, uh vangelis uh, chariots of, of fire soundtrack was really something i was really into and then uh uh, things like uh, Pink Floyd, The Wall. Um, uh, my family owned a VHS copy, so I watched that several times when I was 10, 10 years old or eleven. So that's a heavy movie to watch. Uh, but I was I was really drawn into into that movie as well. And then um, I uh, I started playing in bands when in nineteen ninety one, actually when when I was at sixteen, uh, and I went to um, uh, I went to a, a, a high school that had a like a trade school type of school it was like almost like a high school that you came out of with an associate degree it's called uh, ORT uh, um, and it's an international school and they had one in Argentina and my major was uh, media and communications and um, I went there and uh, I I enjoyed it I, I remember when uh, we had a, a section about radio uh, I was really extremely extremely into it and I remember getting into uh, uh, at home um, uh, recording a lot of uh, uh, almost like uh, radio s- stories on the on the radio, but on tape. I would do it on tape, uh, and then I would spend hours and hours doing that. And then, uh, and then in 1996, I moved to Los Angeles, uh, not with any purpose. I, I couldn't even say I moved to Los Angeles. I just ended up in Los Angeles through an invitation of a friend of mine. And then uh, in 1999, I met Mark when uh, when Dovla was uh, just getting started, and uh, I just thought that it was just one of the most novel ideas. I was really kind of like, "Wow, this guy's really how how interesting." I mean, I didn't I didn't even own a computer, so just the idea that you could transmit sound over the internet thought I just thought it was just so cool and fascinating, and. Uh, and through that, really, I have to say, Davla was the place that uh, I think for all of us, for Mark and for all of us, it became the place where we found each other, we found our community, and, and we built from there. Um, so I, I owe to Davla a lot, you know, really. Um, I, I like the fact that you also said, you know, that you didn't own a computer. And I think that 
That's important to think about. I didn't have my own computer for, for even years after we started DubLab. I didn't have a cell phone. And many of our original DJs and staff members, you know, their first emails came when DubLab started. And, yeah. and so it, I think that it underlines the fact that it's not about technology for us. It's about ideas and music and human connection and whatever. The best tools that are at hand at the given moment, you can use and you can also use tools that are inexpensive and tools that you're, you're using them for, for you know, uh, the purpose they're not meant for. It's kind of like use mutant things, but it's really all about finding a way to reach people through music. And so however, whatever path we get there works. Did you just say using mutant things? Using mutant tools, you know, kind of like, you know, creating <laughs> your own, creating your own tools, you know, like making things, you know, we've, we've used for sound projects, you know, um, say like educational headphone splitters and things like that. Trying to find, trying to find tools to, for audio that, that aren't for their, you know, the original purpose, you know, so. The, mis the misuse of technology, and you could even yeah. argue uh, 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 online radio is a product of that misuse. I don't think when when uh, uh, scientists were creating the internet or when people were using the internet at the moment to to uh, um, to to communicate and, and and share data or information, uh, I don't think anyone thought of of online radio or or, or doing a radio station over the internet. Uh, I remember it was almost like, it felt almost like a hack, kind of like, hey, totally. you know what? No no one knows about this, but you can also transmit audio. And 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 it really felt like it was a misuse of technology. We were using something that wasn't meant for that. We were using it for that. Yeah. And when DubLab started, it wasn't to say, let's do something that is really pushing technology forward. It's let's use the technology that, that we can harness to push music forward. Where were your first offices and how did you decide to staff this darn thing up front? I mean, the first offices came after searching for, for, you know, searching all over, you know, and at that point we had no, you know, credit to our names. We, we had no track record. There was nothing. It was an idea. And so we searched around a bit and um, we ended up finding a space in East Hollywood that was a storefront space um, and an apartment right above it. And we were just a block over from Paramount Studios. And, you know, it might sound fancy, but um, Los Angeles, the way it's built is you can go, you know, one block might be mansions and the next might be, you know, uh, uh, crumbling apartment buildings. And so it changes block to block. And that was really an area that that did change block to block. So we found this kind of crummy storefront, but that really worked for us. And we um, built a, a box within a box, built a studio. And we just had friends, volunteers, people putting in sweat equity to, to build this kind of studio space within a storefront. And above was the uh, apartment, a one bedroom apartment that was an office um, with, you know, uh, more cockroaches than staff members and DJs. And um, we just kind of went from there. It was a cheap spot, um, but it was a place that we could call our own. And, and because of where it was, it was in a wild kind of area and pretty run down spot, but we could make as much noise as we wanted. There was a you know, the place across the street shut down. It was a clinic, a free clinic that was shut down pretty early every day. And so we could spill out into the street and just do our thing, you know? So we had art shows, you know, some of the early connections with Ale were his band Langis would, you know, come and do release shows and play live. And so we'd frequently have these kind of parties that were an excuse to gather the creative community of Los Angeles together in that space, you know? And And it was interesting because anytime that kind of new ideas are forming and this kind of fringe art is emerging, it's also attracting, you know, kind of other folks who might be more established. And so there would be people who'd walk in the door who who we looked up to, you know, who were part of the music community that that we loved, who wanted to kind of catch what this weird buzz was about. You know, what's Internet radio? What's this thing? And so, you know, for us, it was community building, sharing sound, 
uh, through the the channel that that suited us best, which was this kind of international broadcasting model um, where we knew we wouldn't be shut down by the FCC again. So you went from being very um, uh, narrow range Los Angeles broadcasters to stepping into a need to find you, but international space. What was that like and what did that bring to you up early on? Did, did things walk in the door? Because you're just talking about the physical live community part. But what walked in the door from the being out on the internet platform at that still fairly early time? In a, in a way, it, it's true. But we had started actually broadcasting online. So in 1998, the student radio station at USC, I was able to get that up online broadcasting. And... I realized that the university had a real uh, media server that was not being used. It was just in a closet <laughs> in a server rack somewhere that had a license. And so I was able to, I kind of got wind of internet radio and started following some of the kind of early internet radio. And I just kind of found out who had the keys to this server and let them, you know, got the permission to use it. So we started broadcasting full time online in 1998 on KSCR. And it was good because we got shut down just months later by the FCC, our FM broadcast. And so that station still exists to today under a different name, KXSC, because it became an internet radio station. And so we knew that that local broadcasting was important, but we knew that there was pockets of people like us all over the world who were into niche music that we wanted to reach. And so the dub lab was a continuation of that idea. We said, wow, suddenly we have, you know, pockets of listeners all over, really small pockets of listeners. But we said, let's, you know, let's harness this and try to continue it. So that was the idea of continuing dub lab as an online broadcaster um, that, that came on the heels of the student radio station. But we, we're able to start something from scratch with DubLab, whereas a, a student radio station, it's it's much more kind of open door policy, which is great. You know, if somebody wants to come in and put the hours in to, you know, volunteer and then have their own, you know, Broadway show tune, radio show, all good. There's sports radio shows, etc. But we wanted to do something that was built on more of an aesthetic foundation, but the aesthetic foundation was open by nature. But it was this idea of creating a music-focused radio station that was broadcasting music that wasn't being heard on the radio and music from all across time and space, all throughout the universe. And so the idea of future roots came into being because people on the early internet radio tuners, you had boxes to click. What is your genre? And you could choose one usually. Is it rock alternative? What is alternative? You know, it doesn't mean anything, you know, uh, college, classical, indie, did you, and we never felt like we fit any of those boxes because in any given broadcast day on Dub Lab, you would hear avant-garde classical, you'd hear Afrobeat, you'd hear underground experimental electronic music, Jamaican dub. And so we were jumping around not only genre, but, but region and era. And so the idea of future roots came about because we said, let's, offer this wide spectrum expanse of sound to be able to zoom back to the past, but also to use all of the music from the past to push music forward and give a space for the most contempor contemporary music, often straight out of the studio. And I remember reading stories and hearing stories of, you know, uh, uh, in, you know, Detroit radio stations, you know, having, having records hot off the press, somebody would, you know, press up a, you know, a, a record uh, acetate pressing and zoom it down to the radio station and it would go on air straight hot off the presses. And so I like that idea of, you know, giving a space where the first place that music was heard outside of the musician's studio was the dub live airwaves. And that still continues to today. It's sort of a testing ground for new sound, but also a place to kind of honor all of the creative music that came before. So how in the world were you guys paying your personal bills during this time? And was this a 501c3 at the get-go? Did you start out as a nonprofit or do you have some thoughts of the, ah, advertisers may pay for this or people will 
form some kind of a collaboratory? What was the what was the money side of what you thought was going to happen and what happened? Mm-hmm. Early, early Dub Lab was an LLC. It was an LLC, and the idea was to to it almost like a B Corp is now, you know, more in that in that way. But we did. I don't even think that existed at that point. It, it but it was the exist. I, didn't exist. Yeah. So it was this yeah. idea of doing having a business that was a socially responsible business, and so we thought of like on the bigger level, Ben and Jerry's or places like that, where. We could do something that could benefit society. And Dubla was born during this kind of first internet bubble, but not because of the first internet bubble. We came up before Dubla launched. We had offers on the table from all these tech companies. In Los Angeles was the home of kind of the the media content creation side of the internet in the you know the late nineties, but the the audiences weren't there. So suddenly there was speculation and money flowing in. But it was a lot of it was funny money, you know, it was it was Hollywood money that was kind of going in, but it wasn't real money. It was sort of like, you know, uh, imaginary funding at the time. But we had lots of people offering to kind of buy us to partner with us before we even had a website up. And we said no to everything. And it's good that we did because we wanted to grow more like an independent record label or or you know record store something really community based but to do it as an llc and be able to build and kind of give back and be an integral part of the music community we also didn't even really know much about i didn't know much about nonprofits, so i didn't even think it was an option my partner co-founder dub lab is a fellow named john buck who was a young uh, ad sales executive on TV and he hated it, absolutely hated that world. And so he was looking for a way out um, and and got into the idea of internet radio. And so we met um, early on in his kind of time exploring internet radio and decided, let's partner up. You've got the business kind of experience, sort of, you know, very, very early. He, you know, had just been starting out and I had the music and the kind of tech experience or people that I knew who could do that. So we just jumped into it um, and we had money from, you know, family and friends, you know, and uh, his family and friends. I didn't have any, <laughs> any family or friends with money, but um, but we had a little bit of money and, um, you know, he was able to kind of use his ad sales exec talk, you know, and try to sweet talk some people into to putting some money in, but it was still shoestring operation. I mean, we had cheap rent, we had volunteer DJs, we had a small staff, you know, paid, you know, modestly. Um, but we all were into the idea of doing it and uh, just jumped in. But come 2001, the NASDAQ crashed and the whole just boom, the whole kind of bubble burst on the first internet bubble. And um, suddenly, even the little money we had disappeared. And um, I moved out of my apartment and I moved into the studio and I slept on the floor of the studio for two years and I lived there every night. I would roll, roll out a, like a futon thing and I would sleep amongst all these old tower computers with, you know, loud fans and, you know, uh, you know, like I mentioned, cockroaches. And so it it was, it was a (laughs) Knowing that neighborhood, yes, cockroaches. That was definitely. So Ollie, what about you at that time? From the beginning, I was involved uh, with Dublin, as Mark said, uh, playing with my band in there and just kind of hanging around. I was very much a someone on, on the sidelines, right? Some, somewhat involved, involved, but also somewhat uh, watching from the outside. And um, I, I, I do remember the moment when uh, Dublin closed uh, its doors uh, in the studio downstairs and moved everything to the apartment upstairs. And, and I remember... I, I can even see the sheets rolled up in the corner uh, for where Mark uh, live, and 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 that period is is really the period that that if it wasn't for Mark uh, making that sacrifice, uh, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, that's the time where uh, Mark and 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 at the time John John was still involved uh, uh, started finding its way as a nonprofit without even knowing it. I, I remember one time I think one of the turntables broke down. And we needed money for uh, get them fixed, and we started asking on the microphone, "Hey, uh, could anyone donate money and 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 we'll get to get them fixed, right, or something along those lines, or to buy a piece of equipment we needed?" And uh, and and people would donate at the time. I think PayPal was already up and running, and uh, 
people would donate money. And, and we found ourselves uh, uh, kind of formalizing that a little bit more, little by little. And, and uh, about in 2007, I would say 2006, 2007, uh, John was moving on to, to other things in life uh, uh, with family and uh, also, uh, I think, location he was moving uh, out of, of the neighborhood. And uh, Mark brought me in as a uh, full-time uh, a person. Uh, not, not that there was such thing as full-time. It was uh, at, at that time, Davila was very much in a kind of collective, kind of hand-to-mouth uh, operation. And, uh, and I was working for the state at the time. Uh, of all people, I was working for Jackie, Jackie Goldberg. And uh, she was uh, termed out. And uh, and, and as my job was ending, Mark was like, hey, if you want to to join in, uh, that would be great. I would love to, to have you here. And uh, we started exploring the idea of becoming a nonprofit organization because we found ourselves working like a nonprofit. Not so much because uh, we, it's almost like, like the model chose us other more than, us choosing the model. And um, and we found ourselves working with a lot of the cultural institutions in Los Angeles and, and really operating like a nonprofit. So we did, uh, when I came uh, full time, uh, uh, we, we formed like the, the, the nonprofit organization, uh, the 501c3. Uh, we created, uh, at the time, there was enough income to put very modest salaries in place that kept that ball kind of that wheel started to move slowly and um and from there we continued to uh, apply we started applying for grants we started finding formalizing our uh now what we would call fundraisers what we would call the our proton drive which now is a membership drive that we do uh and then doing an anniversary party as a form of fundraising and and other projects that started coming as a form of like earned income as a nonprofit and uh, we kind of learned the two together, right, Mark? We kind of learn how to run a nonprofit, and then we we started getting a very good advice from other nonprofits. Everyone was really generous with their advice and 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 how to do things. And I think we were part. That's another part of Davla that we found ourselves being part of a, a wave of new nonprofits. Uh, I think it was us. Uh, Sasas was another one. Machine Project. Echo Park Film Center, and it was this group of nonprofits that were coming at the same time, and 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 we uh, around 2007, 2008 were part of that, and and that continues to grow up up until today. During this time, I was working with an internet radio company, so I have a little bit of both sympathy and awareness for what was happening. Did did um, and a lot of it was that the industry was trying to figure out. How should internet radio pay for music? Did that impact how you guys rethought or thought about or were now in a maturing space where people were suddenly going, look, there's internet radio. They're playing music. They should be paying for rights. How did that all work when you guys were early on? And did that impact how you guys built the company? I mean, early on it seemed like there was this, it's sort of always that fear of the unknown, you know, or the the desire to control anything emerging is sort of this trend that happens time and time again. It's sort of the dominant powers want to kind of own it. And we've seen that again happen, you know, it's sort of like the deals that are cut with Spotify and various kind of online streamers and the kind of majors then trickle down to, to ensuring, you know, now that the artists get paid fractions of fractions of pennies so it's sort of like the gatekeepers the same people who made the money all along you know try to keep control of it of that money and so there was a lot of a lot of big talk that was happening at the moment and a lot of people that that almost shut down out of fear that they would be shut down and -hmm. so it was interesting that when we started there were more people early early on right when we started dub lab there was many other kind of broadcasters in that field, but it was sort of a dual thing. It was the people who could afford to start an internet radio station on a larger scale were often spending a lot more money and were reliant upon, you know, venture capitalist capitalist investments or to be part of a larger kind of internet media company. All of that imploded in 2001. So suddenly, boom, a lot of people were gone, but also 
there was constant talk about, you know, the kind of clamping down on rights and broadcasting and, and a lot of people kind of like left and, and sh- you know, disappeared at that point. Um, I will say it, you know, it was pretty prohibitive to be able to, to do both, you know, to be able to, um, you know, kind of pay the full rights um, and to be able to exist. And so, you know, it's sort of like the ends justify the means sort of situation. We always knew that we were supporting the artists, the labels, the people that that we were playing on the airwaves and that the money from those royalties and rights, if all of it was paid to the, you know, exact penny, then that wasn't going to the people that we were playing. There was no, none of this money was, was filtering through to, you know, you know, Animal Collective, Oval, any of these kind of avant-garde kind of electronic bands. It was going to the kind of bigger players who, you know, uh, one, as I mentioned, we have always been a space for new music as well as older music. And often when a young artist is coming up, they don't have their publishing set up. They don't have any of that stuff set up. And so we, as best possible, try to give advice and try to offer not only a broadcast platform, but a place for people to come together and um, kind of share tools, you know, so musicians can come together and be in the same space and communicate with each other and learn from each other and learn how to not only work within the existing system, but also create new systems. And so a lot of kind of the DIY music community is the place where a lot of the, the kind of innovation within, you know, kind of funding models comes from. And so when we started, you know, as Ali mentioned, we started our pro, what we called our proton drive fundraiser. And that was built on a public radio fund drive model, but it was really an internet focused um, platform. And so It was pre-Kickstarter, it was pre-any of those crowdfunding platforms online, but we were trying to fine-tune a model to sustain um, through an online platform. So in a way, our kind of funding mechanism was pretty advanced and early. And we also were focused on putting money into the pockets of the musicians themselves through gigs and through other opportunities and still continue to do that to this day. If you look at dub labs uh overall kind of annual budget um a large percentage and ollie would know this uh yeah about correctly. about half 50 percent, about 50 percent of it goes directly into the pockets of uh djs and artists involved with the station so a lot of uh, it's kind so, of going back to the artist mm-hmm. which is important so- you guys have worked together in different roles and combinations over time how has we've had the privilege on this podcast of talking to a few management teams and collaborations how has the way you've worked together changed over time um i mean ollie's very he it's sort of the best thing about a team of people you know is that people bring different skills to the table and if when i was you know full time at dub lab um Ale's desk and my desk faced each other. We, we had our, the backs of our desks were just boom, side to side. So we were facing each other all day. And if you looked at my desk, it was like a tornado. And if you looked at Ale's desk, it was this clean, organized kind of world. Ale has always been so good with routines, with organization, both, you know, the studio itself like you know knowing how to kind of create a clean studio and organized studio as well as kind of routines of workflow of being able to say this you know these hours on a thursday are accounting hours these hours you know so there there's that side where it was like complementary kind of things you know i was always more of the the tornado and you know trying to like a million miles a minute kind of ideas to try to get people excited about things um but but maybe lacking some of the organization um skills so it was always complementary um but i think that you know it's each of us kind of balance and and you know flow in different ways i'm now you know more of kind of 
you know, I don't know, spirit guide kind of, you know, uh, um, consultant kind of uh, project manager uh, right now. Yeah. And I try to be able, you know, I try to talk to Ale frequently on the phone and, you know, just kind of one, give him support after having been the director of the organization for 16 and a half years to be able to say, you know, it's crazy and it's a lot of work and it's intense, but, you know, you're doing an amazing job and the, f- you know, future is bright, you know, because it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah, I, I think that the, the relationship uh, uh, between the two of us, uh, in a way, I have to say, worked exactly the way it was meant to work. You know, there was uh, the, the, the there's not a lot of like uh, uh, exciting things to say of like drama or like this happened and there was an up and down. It's like Mark brought me in. I remember clearly said, hey, I always saw how you run things with your own band you know, very kind of organized or always, you know, setting up these things. And it's like, you know, uh, would you like to, you know, John is moving on. Would you like to come and, and take that role and a little more administrative? And and, uh, and and that is kind of sort of the way it worked. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I agree with Mark that we complement each other. I think uh, I, I, I do bring that uh, more like a that idea of systems, uh, but also being coming from music, being a musician myself, uh, don't have the rigidity of someone that comes from accounting, right, or administrative totally, totally, practices. Yeah. I, I have a loose, I'm loose enough that I think for the music world I could be really organized, but for the business world I could be too loose, maybe for comfort, you know, in, yeah. in some ways. But uh, you know, we do keep things running, and I think we do uh, balance and complement each other uh, these days. Yes, as director. Uh, I, I, I guess I took over Mark's role, but Mark does continue to very much be that force behind it. Uh, things that, uh, that if Mark wouldn't be involved, uh, uh, you know, as founder, as, as kind of like, almost like, like you said, Mark's spirit guide, uh, we, we would definitely, uh, be impacted in a, in a negative way. So, um, uh, the, the relationship, uh, um, uh, continues to evolve, but also continues to kind of work the exact same way it was meant to work from the beginning. And I think opening up a space to, you know, say at some point, you know, Ale will likely not be the director of the station. He'll likely open up that role for somebody else to come into the space. Dub Lab has always been about bringing new people into the fold um, and kind of new energy, new ideas. And, but he'll be there as somebody who can help kind of guide and advise and encourage whoever steps into that space next. And so it's always been about building and expanding and diversifying. And that's been really something when I stepped out of the role of director to go back to, to graduate school in, in 2015, um, you know, it was sort of this moment at Dublab where there's a lot that was changing, but it was also, you know, this moment where said, Ali, you're ready to do do this and, you know, you can totally, you know, lead this thing. And it's been thriving since. And he's brought in people to, to take on different roles in the station who are so incredible and all this kind of young energy that then will themselves kind of, you know, bring in new people. So it's always this kind of cascade of this kind of continuum of creative people who are involved. And that's really, I think, what sets up the the station to have longevity you know we look at we look at institutions an institution is not an institution until time has passed you know it's sort of like it takes time to kind of you know uh you know grow and settle and and become something that that has kind of a a history to it and dub lab now at 21 years is on its way but we look to you know WFMU radio on the East coast and, you know, an entity that's been around for over 75 years now. And we take advice and guidance from places like that, or look at, you know, the uh, Smithsonian folkways and look at like the, the ethos of places like that record labels that are fearless and their exploration of sound and kind of, again, the ends justify the means you might, some of the way you work might not be pretty in any moment. You know, the, the director of the organization might be the one bringing the bags of trash out at the anniversary party fundraiser, you know, people are all coming together. (laughs) Exactly. You know, and I remember at, at the parties, like I remember also, Ollie and I just run scrambling around and emptying trash cans, people like that. And and I think that 
the young people see that and they then realize, okay, it's all about giving more than you take. And it's all about contributing to that greater cause. And I think that that model is very precious. If you set that sort of model, then people can kind of continue with that ethos and then it has a, a long life from there. Yes. Uh, setting up, a, a make a, when Mark uh, left as director and I took over, uh, that was the big test for the organization in, in, in saying, are we an organization or is this a, a, a kind of a one-man show? Is it one, one person's vision? Uh, and then uh, it's over, right? When we, when that person leaves. And, uh, I think we went through one of the tests, uh, with that, uh, I think uh, I've been, uh, I mean, time will tell, but I think it's been now four and a half years or almost five that I, that I, uh, uh assumed the, the direct, the role of director. And, um, and, and I think we, we proved that we can pass the torch to the next uh the next person and and that test comes with every new generation of people that gets involved uh, are, have you set up the systems that allowed for that transition and you're not holding on to that that uh i don't know if you want to call it power or or whatever whatever is it that you're doing you're not passing the tools to the next uh, group of people so they can fully take over and uh and that's what we work towards uh all the time uh there's nothing more i'd like to see uh when i move on that that, that i can pass this to another person and they are successful at this uh, i definitely don't see it as a way of, of of trying to hold on to it uh for as long as possible so you guys are at a point in time now where this is a big social and life transformation for lots of organizations. We're recording this in October 2020. Uh, when people listen back, they'll either know that we're deep in the middle of uh, recovering from a massive dislocation or there we're still at the early stages of a mass dislocation. How has the COVID shift work and create from home economic disruptions and all of that goes with it? impacted both your work and your perspectives uh well for, first and foremost the, the the first impact uh that we we saw that was immediate was the shutting down of our studio we always uh, uh saw dub lab as a place where half of our mission uh can be heard on air that's the program we create but the other half that people don't see is the interactions uh that uh that are created in our space you know when all the DJs cross paths when someone is in the neighborhood and drops by and sits by our coffee table and 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 you know shares uh, uh stories about music or chats or dialogues that happen uh, uh there on a daily basis and that was over immediately on on March 13 um so that that that's a big impact that, that there's that side that half of our mission that is no longer happening. Uh, since then we've been able to, um, to continue creating programming and uh, luckily enough have a, uh, uh, community roster of DJs where most of them have the ability to, to create programs from their homes, from their studios, and and some that don't, uh, we try to in very safe ways uh, to give them access to our studio. And they're like few and far in between, so it, it's pretty safe. The, the the handful of times we've done it, uh, so in that sense, we continue to do it. Uh, in terms of funding, uh, we've been fortunate enough to have the we we've been proven we we. We've been able to be resilient, to pivot, to adapt, and to find ways to continue uh, staying funded. Uh, I think that is um, that is a testament to to the history of the organization, to the connections in the community, to the support from the community, and the the, the foundation and the roots that that we created over twenty years. I think if this would have caught us in our early stages, we wouldn't have had that network of, of funding that would allow us to continue. Uh, but because of we've been around for 20 years, I think we're light enough or small enough as an organization to be able to adapt quickly, yet also uh, have enough experience and enough connections to to remain funded. Uh, so, um, uh, so far, I mean, knock on wood, I mean, it's, this is not over. So I don't think where anyone is at a place where you can claim uh, um, 
victory, you know, or like uh, being over this. But so far, we can we we care for very very carefully optimistic that uh, maybe we'll be able to to survive this. It's you know as Ali mentioned the idea of you know the studio being shut down if you had had said that was going to happen without the COVID pandemic and without, you know, the larger societal changes that were coming into play, it would have been pure panic at that point. But the fact that we, you know, we and everyone else was kind of going through this major shift and to think of new ideas and new modes of kind of communication and broadcasting, it was, it's actually been an incredible experiment and has shifted and helped us kind of, you know, think of a lot of new ideas. And and I would say that the Dub Lab, you know, broadcasting and activities have, have been expanding in a way and that our scope of, you know, the guests that we have. I this morning was setting up a guest session with Hans Joachim Rodelius uh, from Germany. And, you know, the international scope of it has been expanding because we've been looking at these kind of online communication tools to record interviews and such. And so I think that there's challenges, there's things that 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 are kind of like you know, doing operating in a way, you know, that that is the best for the moment. But there's also ideas that are going to kind of we'll be able to carry forward that kind of transcend this time, the new kind of innovations that come out of the struggle that are going to be in our toolkits for years down the road. And that that's what I'm really excited about. So we are near the end of our conversation. We could probably talk for another couple hours about you guys's adventures and executions. And uh, I guess I have one more question and then I'll ask you guys what you might want to share back with people we haven't talked about. How do you think about and measure your impact? Because with traditional terrestrial radio, you've got somebody else giving you a ratings metric and telling you what's going on. You guys see a lot of your direct data, but you've got kind of a diaspora of information going out and and energy. How do you see what your impact is short-term and long-term? Well, uh, there's one side of things where we look at at our impact through, as you mentioned, through data, through how many uh, people listen, uh, tune in live, uh, which you have some access to it, some other Third-party tuners will share some numbers, but not all of them. So we do get a fair, we get a, a fairly accurate picture of, of how many people uh, listen live. Then also we look at the uh, how many people access our archives, and then uh, what's the uh, you know followers on social media. That that always gives you a sense of, of how many people are out there engaging with your content. Uh, but aside from that, uh, we haven't been overly obsessive about. Uh, the, the measuring the impact. I can tell you for once at a very personal level, and this is like uh, off, off, if you want to say it, off the record as a double up director, but at a personal level, I have never, never uh, really cared about it. I, I, I care really only about the quality of the programming. And, 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 and I truly believe that that's the only thing that matters. I do look at uh, impact as now putting the hat of a doublet director i do look at the impact and try to measure it but but i cannot bring myself personally to 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 really kind of care i, I really just care of the, if the program is good people will find out about it but but again uh, we we do take those uh, those measurements uh, 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 and we do measure the impact through those ways that I just mentioned. And we do have a team of people. Uh, we have uh, Brennan, who's our CTO. We have uh, uh, Rachel, who's our program director, uh, Gabriel Costa, who's our uh, communications director. And all of them look at this full picture and that's how we measure it. I think that Ale is right that the, the kind of numbers of, you know, the it's almost like the myth of success um, doesn't matter as much. Um, I think a lot of, you know, say young musicians are looking at like their Spotify followers and things like that as a gauge of success. But I think that for us, it's really about focusing on grassroots, personal connection, word of mouth. And that's always how we've grown with Dub Lab, that it's more of that kind of deeper connection of people really, you know, feeling 
like aligned with our vision that's important. And I think that the success is really hearing personally from people feedback where they say, you inspired me to, you know, start a record label. You inspired me to make music. You inspired me to start a venue, a radio station. And those stories, I think that's when we realize that we're having an impact or the stories that people over the years have said, you saved my life, you know, music coming into my world from you. I was at a a rough time in my life and we had many people who said, you know, you actually saved my life. And so that stuff is really what's important. And the fact that, you know, from day one, it was like, if we could do that for one person and shift society in a more positive kind of channel, then it's successful. And I think we've been able to do that over and over again. So that sort of metric is more important, that personal feedback and connection. When, when, when it comes to, to add to that, when, when, when it comes to, uh, uh, measuring or, or calculating the impact of, uh, of, uh, programs that could be on DevLab, that's even more, more of an extreme case where we just never, I, I don't think any new DJ on DevLab I ever looked at their social media presence or the potential for bringing new listeners. Uh, we just looked at, do we like this person? Do you think, do we think it's representative of the community we, we support? And, uh, and, and sometimes even almost kind of trying to look at the quietest voices in the room and try to amplify those voices, but really looking, which one is the one that everyone else is ignoring? Okay, let's take that one. That's the person I want, you know, uh, at the station. And that, that's that been our story in a way. Thank you for joining this conversation as we wrap up. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you'd like to call out before we wrap? I, I'm excited, you know, for people to, again, you know, you, you mentioned that we're in this this very particular moment in time right now with, you know, the kind of COVID pandemic and also in, in you know, the struggle for social justice. And I think that that music is so important in this time and, and that connection. And again, for us, it's really, it's about human connection. It's not the the tools that are important. It's about people feeling feeling, yeah, excited and feeling uh, aligned, you know, being here on this kind of planet together and, and having a, a positive shift. And so um, I hope that that people kind of keep uh, keep optimistic and know that, you know, in these kind of times of change, you know, good things can come out of it as well. And so we're just pushing on to the future and happy to have people along for the ride. How would you like people to reach out to you and who would you like to reach out to you? Uh, for DubLab in general, info at DubLab.com always gets to us. Uh, I We check all the emails. Uh, and uh, so if you want to reach out, if you want to ask more questions, uh, jump on a call, conversations, info for information, uh, in info at DubLab.com. And du- DubLab across all social media um, is, a, is an easy way to kind of get in touch. And so we're always eager to hear from people. And I'm assuming financial contributions, always welcome. Of course, please. Uh, you can always tab on the support uh, tab and uh, on our website and consider becoming a sustaining member, making a one-time donation, uh, check our shop. There's a lot of great merch. That is another way to support. And uh, if you want to become a, an underwriter or a major donor, also reach out or check our uh, pages for that, for those programs. And I uh, would love to to have you involved. Well, I'm so glad that you guys joined me today. Thank you for being part of the conversation. Thank, Thank you, you, Gigi. So much. Thanks so Thank much. And there's the adventure. Thanks for joining us. Please reach out to DubLab if you would like to get engaged in, or involved with them. And please let us know what you'd like to hear on future episodes. Share this episode on your favorite podcast player with your friends. And come back soon for our next episode of Creative Innovators with Gigi Johnson.